Thank you guys for coming tonight. It really means a lot to me and the panelists. I'm so excited to talk to y'all tonight. Um, so I figured to jump right in, we would just give a little bit of background on um, Cindy Poitier's career up until To Serve With Love um, is released. I know he won the Academy Award in 64, um, and he had a few career, career milestones before his big year in 67. So I was just hoping we could lead up to that to begin. Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I suppose I'll, I'll speak to, you know, the bigness and the glory of 1967, right? To Sir With Love comes out in June of 1967, uh, In the Heat of the Night comes out in August of 67, and then Guess Who's Coming to Dinner comes out in December of 67. So it is a stunning year in terms of providing um, a really interesting opportunity to see a kind of range to Poitier's uh, work. Uh, that, you know, just, I can't even comprehend really those three films in this so closely apart. I mean, I, I would just sort of like add to that. I think the, the fact that he is, not just that he's in these three films, but he, he's the star of three big films in the same year also sort of speaks to this, this incredibly um, significant moment of like black stardom, the likes of which I don't think had been seen before that. I mean, if we're thinking about just sort of the history of like Hollywood representation, especially where black actors and actresses were always sort of supporting characters. I mean, even like the fabulous, fantastic supporting characters, but the idea that like it would be a Sidney Poitier film, mm -hmm. that you're coming to see Sidney Poitier as, as the star, I think also speaks to the power of his celebrity, which is not something that um, was like a thing. Um, but, before him for the most part. Speaking of um, kind of Poitier and his celebrity um, and in this big year that he's having, I'm also interested in kind of who were his contemporaries and who were the people he kind of came up with because we know that, you know, oftentimes when there's these big stars, they, they didn't get there alone um, and they, he, there were other actors that he worked with. Um, so I'm wondering like who would they be and kind of what were they up against similarly during this time? I mean, I'm always sort of, and, and Michael, you can feel free to, to, to to jump in as, as you see fit, but I'm always interested in like the relationship between Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte at the same time, and knowing that they were, you know, that they were friends, and that they were also both very active in the civil rights movement, and they sort of were talking about what was going on in Hollywood and talking about scripts and helping each other prepare for roles, um, which is a, a relationship that I always think is really interesting, um, given that I think particularly in the sort of logic of, of like Hollywood representation and tokenism, there can only be one, <laughs> um, and I have to imagine that they were often up for like the same roles. Um, and so I think that that relationship as contemporaries, but also friends, colleagues, and allies is really, um, is really important. Yeah, um, I, I mean, Harry Belafonte immediately comes to mind, but also for me, it's, it's quite crucial to think about their, um, their kind of political and social collaborations as well. I mean, there's the incredible story of when Sidney Poitier is approached to uh, do In the Heat of the Night, and he's just kind of straight up, I'm not going below the Mason-Dixon line. And all of that is very much based on his experience with Harry Belafonte of flying down to the South to uh, help deliver ransom money for the search for the missing civil rights workers, right? And eventually, I think they settled on Tennessee, Tennessee for a few of the scenes in the heat of the night. But for the most part, it's an Illinois film. Uh, uh, you know, I'm also thinking about um, uh, in, in, in a kind of political collectivity uh, that would also include Ruby Dee and Ozzie Davis as well. Um, but all of them kind of having these collateral interests of not only contributing to the civil rights struggle, but also trying to thrive within uh, a Hollywood system which in many ways still is of the tone of it's just not into you. But then I think in addition, then you also have this sort of, um, the other example of like Sammy Davis Jr. Um, who's around at the same time, who never becomes a big, and he doesn't ever become a big film star, right? I mean, he like he's in films, like he's in he's in Ocean's Eleven, and and he's in like the Porgy and Best that we'll never <laughs> that we'll never see, right? Because, uh, uh. but but I mean, you also have Sammy Davis Jr., right? Who also is a, is a celebrity. I mean, I feel like there's also this this um, 
line or this kind of subtle distinction that I want to draw between sort of black celebrities and then like black celebrity film actors, right? Because Sammy Davis Jr. was a celebrity. I mean, he, he's a headliner in Las Vegas and he's you know, part of the Rat Pack and he's very big on television, um, but he, he doesn't make that, that transition into film stardom even though like, he, he, he clearly wanted to, right? Um, and so I think that's another interesting um, you know, sort of contemporary, I, I mean, do, there's also the other person that's like floating in the, the, elephant, in the, room. the elephant in the room, the other contemporary. Yeah. I mean, like, there's Bill Cosby, too, right? I mean, and there's, and there's like, Sidney Poitier's, like, later collaborations. But, I mean, I'm thinking about this kind of moment in the, in the mid-'60s. And so even if we're talking about Cosby, I'm thinking of, like, I Spy I'm on television, right, with, 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 um, with Culp, um, uh, with Robert Culp. And so there's this kind of moment where, you know, in my estimation, there's a real sort of hunger and interest around these sort of figures of, like, black cosmopolitan, like, polished masculinity, of which Sidney Poitier is is like the icon of that, especially in the mid 60s. Just, just to add that, I mean, I think that uh, in terms of thinking of a, uh, in this period of a somewhat comparable resonating kind of issue around black femininity, I'm thinking of Diane Carroll. Um, she wins, uh, she's the first African American to win an Emmy in 1968 for Julia. And then thinking of Gordon Parks, who is the first African American to direct a, a Hollywood film in 69 with The Learning Tree. So there is a kind of mainstreaming, um, which we can get into later, falls into a, a, a kind of overdeterminance and exceptionalism that becomes a problem as the decade goes on. Actually, I'm curious about kind of. Um, the end of the decade, right? So 67, Poitier has this, you know, these three huge films that come out um, and, you know, civil rights movements kind of giving way to black power, um, the black power movement. And I was curious about how, kind of the ways that celebrities and stars at the time began to pivot um, or if there were any kind of particular roles they were bypassing. Um, and then I figured we can get kind of in, a little bit into the 70s and how, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, Michael, you just brought up this, um, that, that phrase like exceptionalism. And, and so I, I think it's also important um, to understand Sidney Poitier not, not just as a celebrity unto himself, but also sort of within this kind of like historical pendulum swing between different types of, of, of like black representation. And so if we're thinking about, for example, like the 30s and the 40s and, and black celebrities like Lincoln Perry, AKA Step and Fetch It and Mantan Moreland and Hattie McDaniel who, who are also playing, you know, maids and butler characters um, in supporting roles and real sort of like hunger and desire for something uh, for like respectable characters for um, polished charismatic sort of leading men you get Sidney Poitier but of course I mean the 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 thing that's always underneath that is sort of the ways that his respectability in films I'm thinking you know like his 50s and 60s stuff like they always come at the cost of him being like in any ways like a sexual like agent in those. I mean, it's interesting when you watch um, To Start With Love, because I, I was really struck by the fact that, like, like, the clear, like, thing in the air is, like, everybody wants him, like, the other teacher wants him, and, like, and Pamela wants him, and, you know, I mean, but he himself is not flirting with, like, there's, we can't sort of intimate a romance between him and the other teacher, even though it's clearly, like, it's in the novel, right? Yeah, there, they have a, there's, there's a romance with Jillian, the other teacher that's in the source work. There's actually a whole chapter in the book devoted to when he goes to visit her family. Mm -hmm. But I mean, thinking about just the, you know, sort of issues around um, Hollywood, whether it's censorship or production code stuff, or, you know, just kind of like social mores or whatever. I mean, like, you, you can't get that in this film. What we get are like a million shots of like Pamela, like just staring, like googly eyed at him as, as he's teaching her, right? Like as this sort of, you know, to like convey um, his, his virility and his attractiveness. And even thinking about um, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which is a film which is all about an interracial romance, but there are no scenes of that couple embracing or kissing except at the very beginning of the fil film where they're shown kissing, but through the rear view mirror. So it's not even like a, a direct shot, right? And so um, it, 
you know, as we get to the end of the decade, I mean, there's also then kind of the, the pendulum swing sort of in this other direction against that, which is like, uh, like, why can't, if you have this romantic leading man, why can't he kiss or like, I don't know, like have sex with somebody, right? Like that's the thing um, that happens in movies. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a direct line, but it's like, and then you get Sweet, Sweet Back, right? Sweet Sweet Back's badass song, which is like, uh, uh, right? As far removed from like Portier 60 stuff as you can possibly get. Um, and I, I mean, I think you, you see Portier like, adapting and evolving with the change in times. I mean, all of his 70s like directorial work, right? It feels like what happens when he gets to sort of be behind the camera, have some kind of control over his story, that he actually gets to be interesting characters and not necessarily um, just characters who have to like bear the burden of representing the race. Yeah, just to, I mean, in terms of the, the, the what your allusion to the burden of representation, I mean, there's, when you look at the, I guess, the history of black film criticism, there is often this kind of trash tendency that borders on the... Trash I said a trash tendency <laughs> that borders on this kind of Highlander clause that there can only be one, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, the problem with that, with, uh, that people might have with the range of work that Sidney Poitier was doing, to me the bigger problem is that, that there just weren't uh, a range of different kinds of characters. Mm -hmm. His character, the kind of characters he played alone aren't the problem. It's that it was the only kind of character that was being allowed at the time. Mm -hmm. So that when you get to um, the rise of black exploitation after Sweet Sweetback, Shaft, and Superfly, it's quite easy to be dismissive, but again, it just ends up putting in place another kind of overdetermined sure. kind of uh, role. Right. Um, I'm interested kind of also in, in terms of stardom, right? You know, so I was reading a little bit about this film to prepare. Um, and um, I was very interested in how this was actually one of the highest grossing films of 1967. And I believe he made um, a film deal at the time that was a little unprecedented in that he agreed to take a smaller pay cut in order to get 10% of the box office. So he kind of like really cashed out with this movie, which I'm like, okay, Mr. Poitier. <laughs> um, but I, I'm thinking about the ways that knowing one's worth and playing roles such as this um, then allows him to have the autonomy later in his career as a director um, and kind of what that relationship is like in terms of the ways that black actors use their celebrity to create opportunity for themselves. Hmm. I mean, I also think um, it also feels really important to situate this within like a history of the Hollywood industry. And so I'm thinking about like 67 as being like, kind of right, like the last, like like the, the, the gasps of the Hollywood studio system, like right before it, it dies, <laughs> right before like, and that's kind of done in like, what, like six, I don't know, 68, 69, something like that. I always, I always think about Jerry Lewis um, and uh, Ladies Man as kind of being like the end of that. But, um, but thinking about, and, and so what I mean by that is like, there being an opening too, right? Um, where performers suddenly have some like clout to be able to make those deals in ways that I think would have been kind of, would have been fairly unprecedented like even 10 years before that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, and I say that to say, it also speaks to Poitier's vision and sort of his, his, his business mind and his strategizing in Hollywood is someone who's been in this industry for quite some time to be able to see those openings and sort of have the vision to make these deals, which, I mean, now that idea of like actors getting part of the back end of a deal, like that's fairly, like that's not a new concept. Right. I mean, but that, that would have been um, a pretty big deal, like 467. Mm -hmm. um, and so him sort of, I think having an understanding of his clout, his, an understanding of the power of his own celebrity to, to be able to sort of make that ask or make that demand, I think is incredibly significant. Yeah, um, yeah, that's so spot on. Uh, I, I suppose what I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, the ways that Sidney Poitier ends up building um, a kind of directorial style out of his own experience and, and actually having a bit more demand over productions, uh, whether you're looking at that run of Uptown, Saturday Night, Let's Do It Again, and Piece of the, a Piece of the Action, or even looking at something later like Stir Crazy. I mean, people have talked about how there's, there's a distinct way of understanding that 
you know, there's a reason why there's a lot of long takes in a Sidney Poitier directed film, and that's because he really is allowing actors to have more room for improvisation, mm -hmm. right? And so developing this kind of signature style uh, based on his own experience, I think, is quite fascinating. I mean, I also think that, I mean, you said when we were chatting um, earlier that he's a, what do you say, he's like an actor's director? He's an actor's, he's an actor's director. I mean, I think, if I'm also just thinking about kind of the role of black performers within Hollywood, um, it feels like the emphasis is always on performance, partly because like black direct, like black directors, that wasn't a thing um, for a very long time, right? And so thinking about, I don't know, I, I guess I just, I also think about actors like Lincoln Perry, but also Hattie McDaniel, performers who had a very keen understanding of like the value that their performance brought to a film mm -hmm. um, and understanding how to monetize that. Um, that feels, I put Portier sort of within that like legacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was actually reading um, Richard Wesley's uh, memoir, um, who he wrote, uh, you know, Uptown Saturday Night, Let's Do It Again. And he was talking about how on the black theater scene in the black arts movement, they made pamphlets kind of criticizing Poitier's roles in these films. And then he was kind of, you know, brought to his office to potentially write, you know, this film and, and ended up writing the film. And I was really interested also in the way that he was kind of clued in to what was being said on the ground and what was um, going on in the community as someone who was looking to direct. You know, I, I think originally he wanted like Richard Pryor and Red Fox to be in Let's Do It Again. And then um, was in it because he was able to kind of wield his power to also have more autonomy behind the camera and within the story by being in front of the screen. And I always thought that was a really interesting anecdote about mm -hmm. where he's positioned mm -hmm. um, in the community at the time. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, yeah, there's, there's so, he's, he's hyper vigilant about his image um, and, and very deliberate about the roles and very deliberate about um, organizing productions in this way. Um, and you know, for better or worse, that does lead into problems about how he's perceived uh, or, or people's inability to distinguish between his characters and who he is as a person, which I think is kind of the larger problem with the way people talk, think about film anyway. But um, he particularly suffered that um, and weathered it. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have the same kind of bitterness, say, of, like when you read uh, Lincoln, that Lincoln Perry interview in the 70s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When he's, like, working in a strip club and he's introducing the dancers and he's just like, if it wasn't for me, there'd be no Charlie Chaplin, damn it. You know, and it's just... And I think, didn't he, like, I'm trying to remember if I'm getting my anecdotes. I think, didn't he, like, sue Robert Townsend in Hollywood Shuffle for defamation of character? I mean, there's a lot of, there's like, lot of there's a lot of stuff there. Yeah, yeah. You don't mm -hmm. get that kind of bitterness from uh, Poitier uh, mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that to a certain degree that maybe because of maybe the nature of the roles, I know that even in, in his time, you know, there was a limitation, um, but he was someone who was like deeply revered and, and kind of, you know, I think a lot, when I think of him and his work, sometimes I think about specific like notions of respectability. And I'm curious about how he both benefited from that as well as, mm -hmm. you know, didn't and how in his later work, he kind of pushed against it a little bit. I mean, there's the, um, what's the, like, I, I always think about, like, wh whichever that year that was, the Oscars, where Denzel Washington won Best Actor for Training Day and Halle Berry wins for Monsters Ball, and then Sidney Poitier gets, like, the, which, honorary, like, the honorary, honorary, it was like, Ooh, uh, <laughs> like, you know, um, and, and, and Denzel says, when he, t I, I just love his speech because he gets up there and he says, he says, he like, two birds with one statue, like, you know, I mean, it's just very much acknowledging kind of, like, the, the politics of the, of the Academy, um, but one of the things that I think is really interesting is that in interviews, Denzel Washington said that he had talked to Sidney Poitier about the types of roles he was playing and that Sidney Poitier had actually cautioned him him early in his career against always playing these kind of respectable um, characters because he himself, because Poitier felt that he had been sort of pigeonholed into those um, and wasn't able to sort of like play the diversity of characters he wanted to play. I mean, he has a quote um, in a great essay by scholar um, Arthur Knight where he, uh, the quote is something like, um, there's no great joy in being a symbol. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think to Michael's point, uh, as someone who very much understood kind of like the landscape and as you're saying, very much in touch with like what the community was saying, like he, he understood how he was functioning in these films, you know, and I mean, I, and I think brought a great depth and complexity to the roles to the extent that he was able to. Um, but I, I mean, I think he, he obviously got it, you know, hence, hence this advice to Denzel Washington, like, yeah, you should play some villains, like, yeah. you know. I mean, I, I, 
I guess I'm thinking a lot about your own work on, on the limitations of positive negative representation debates, you know. Um, it seems significant to me that uh, Sidney Poitier didn't have the opportunity uh, or privilege or really an interest in perhaps approaching his career as an actor with any measure of ambivalence, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that it was always this kind of uh, insistent uh, on uh, uh, his own kind of sense of double consciousness mm -hmm. of, of not only how he is seen by some random others, but just how he is in some ways uh, positioned himself as embodying mm -hmm. um, a people and a community. Whether it was realistic or not, that was the choice that he made. I mean, one of the things that, um, <clears throat> that I think that Samantha Shepard, who couldn't um, be here tonight, uh, does a really good job of pointing out in her, she has a really fantastic um, piece in The Atlantic um, about Sidney Poitier that, that came out right after, after he passed away. And one of the things she talks about is, is sort of like what he brings in terms of his performance. I mean, we talk a lot about like the slap in, in the heat of the night, but we don't talk enough about like lilies of the field and how he's like there you know there's like this this part does where does he slap the nun in he, the he, he, no he does not slap the nun um but there's the part where he's like bargaining or he's like you know trying to like do something and someone in this man calls him boy right there's like there's just so much in Sidney Poitier's like bodily performance um like all of the things that are not on the page that he sort of represents in how he's like you just see him tense up and you see his jaw clench and like you think about all you know and you can sort of tell all the things he's thinking and wants to do but cannot do I mean that's just that's that's all him, you know? Um, there's so much nuance in his performance in this film as he weathers like every like little jerky thing that these like kids throw at him over and over and over again. Um, and, you know, and of course, like until the moment that he erupts, right? Like, um, so, I, or even the ending where, where he's so sort of overtaken with emotion that he, he can't even really get the words. I mean, so much of of what he brings is not on the page, I would imagine, right? It's in his, in his sort of unique performance. Is there any particular role that he's done that you favor, that you think is kind of working against the, the embodiment, as you say? I mean, I, I just love him in Uptown Saturday Night. I just, yeah. I, I really, I, and I think partly it's, it's him, but it's not him because he's not, I mean, he's, he's not doing anything radically different. I think it's the framing. I think there's something for me that is someone who also, like, I really adore Lilies of the Field. Like, I, I love Lilies of the Field. Um, but, you know, you have this kind of, like, you have the Poitier films where he's just dropped into white worlds, right? And that's like, that's like Lilies of the Field, and that's a sir with love. I mean, like, we don't know where he comes from. He's just, you know, Lilies of the Field is like, he, he just, we start the film, he's like by the side of the road. You're like, and, it's, <laughs> and he's called Homer and all the allusions to the Odyssey and this wanderer, like, and then he just, you know, and then at the end he leaves, right? And even in, um, uh, um, uh, guess who's coming to dinner? It's, it's like at the end he's boarding a plane to go to Hawaii, like he's just, and he's leaving, right? Um, because he can't, he can't stay in that world. Right. He, can, he can visit that world, but he cannot stay there. I mean, that, that always feels like the message of a lot of these films. Um, I mean, he obviously stays at the end of um, To Stir With Love, but again, he just like, he pops up and you're like, why are you here? Like, this, <laughs> uh, you know? Um, so for me, as much as I, there's so much about these films individually that I like, I really enjoy that shift that happens with Uptown Saturday Night. Um, but also like Buck and the Preacher, right? Like, I mean, I like seeing him in black world because that was not what his early celebrity was predicated on. Mm -hmm. So I sort of enjoy that sort of shift, that pivot, um, where he's in a completely different context. Um, I, I mean, I'm a fan of the, 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 the kind of, uh, the latter two Miss, uh, Mr. Tibbs films. Um, neither one of them was particularly successful, but they call me Mr. Tibbs in the organization. I just like that seeing that character seemingly in uh, these black spaces, if you, as you put it. Um, I love that whole run of Uptown Saturday Night, let's do it again, and um, um, piece of the action. I mean, hell, I even like Sidney Poitier and Sneakers. So, has anybody seen Sneakers? Oh, oh, look at that. There's, there's that hope in the world. <laughs> there really is. Yeah. I mean, every, every role that he took on, mm -hmm. there was always something uh, distinctive about it that to me was bigger than 
the accusations of him always being the ebony saint or that he was, uh, you know, I, 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 I guess I'm thinking of uh, uh, someone who was arguing with me of like, uh, how can you say that he's not sexy? He's the sexiest damn thing on the screen in anything he's in. So that's, I kind of lean that way too. Not to um, create a binary, of course, but also thinking about just like alternate entryways um, to his legacy. You know, I thought a lot about how like, for me, you know, I was, I was born in the late 90s and um, <laughs> I know, but um, my, my entryway to, to Sidney Poitier and his legacy is actually let's do it again because I had a conversation with um, my parents about the Notorious B.I.G., right? His, mm -hmm. his name is Biggie Smalls and that's Calvin Lockhart's character um, and let's do it again. And I think that's, a very interesting lineage in terms of like Poitier's impact outside of, mm -hmm. um, you know, the confines in which we think of him um, mm -hmm. as being. So yeah. I mean, there's also something about those films, right? Like if it's if it's like Uptown Saturday Night, let's do it again, because it, it puts. I mean, to your earlier question, when you said who are his contemporaries, I mean, I feel like the story of the first half of his Hollywood career is that he has no contemporaries. It's like that exceptionalism thing, right? It's 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 just him, right? Um, it, it's 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 sort of like almost anticipating what we get with like Eddie Murphy in the 80s where like you can have like the biggest global box office star be like this black man but like no other black people are going to get any roles doing anything um and so there's sort of that and then when you put him in these other films like next to a Cal Calvin Lock Lockhart suddenly Sidney Poitier is in conversation right and so and, and his stardom and his celebrities in conversation with these other types of black celebrities right um which I think is a really like really interesting yeah, especially, um, I know there was recently an article about like the notion of being black famous and kind of yeah, the ways yeah, in which, you yeah. know, um, your fame and, and your legacy can exist in a different sphere within the black community than it does at large with, you know, a different kind of audience. Um, so mm -hmm. that's, I think that was interesting, kind of that tension when I was coming to this talk, thinking about like, how do I know Sidney Poitier? I mean, it's in, I mean, you bring up black, you brought up like, yeah, there's that, that, that article that just came out on black famous. I mean, there's the... Like when Kevin Hart had that show, like Real Husbands of Hollywood, that was on BT. I mean, there's a whole riff with him and Chris Rock about like, well, and Chris Rock's like, well, I'm famous, but you're black famous, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and in some ways, that's the thing about Sidney Poitier too, right? Is that he he was not black famous. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that should should actually open up questions for us about which audiences we privilege, right? And which types of stardom and which types of reverberations um, we count as mattering in terms of sort of cultural resonance and like impact. Do you know what I mean? Um, which are, I mean, which is a, a larger philosophical question, but yeah. No, and thinking about the entire arc of his career, I think it's not only a lesson and uh, a lesson and opportunity to kind of study craft, uh, but it's also a lesson in um, being much more conscious about, in some ways, the expectations that we have of film uh, are too much. Mm -hmm. um, in many ways, uh, this kind of insistence that the image has to be positive, um, that, the Im that it has to have a 401k, that it know how to tie a bow tie, that it can change a tire. <laughs> At some point, we need to understand that we're talking about a film and we're not talking about people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think often um, that got lost in, as time went on with the reception of Sidney Poitier's work. Yeah, I think that, you know, we talked about earlier a little bit about how respectability politics can be a hindrance um, from allowing someone to be fully human, you know, quote unquote human in that way. And that we need to humanize groups of people and that can be incredibly limiting. But it also, I mean, I also think it, it undermines like the strength of his performances and the strength of his films, right? Because if we're only ever, I mean, it's like, I just, every time we talk about this, I keep having, I just keep imagining that I'm sitting with my mom, like watching a film and, you know, and my mom, like, this is great. Like, why do you think this is great? Like, because look at where we were. Like, but if you, but if you're only ever evaluating Sidney Poitier in comparison to whatever your bad object is, right? What, what, like, let's say Mantan Moreland, who I adore, but like, right, if you're only ever saying, well, he's not that, then we're never actually sort of focusing on what he is. And what he is in these films is, is special and, and sort of deserving of analysis. Um, and it's not just that he's not that other thing, right? I mean, even regarding performance, you know, I was thinking, earlier when I was doing some research and, you know, watching some of his films, I was just like, he's it also- a lot of work for the, like, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You know, I had to come prepare. I'm with some heavy hitters over here, y'all. I wasn't going to look stupid, but, 
<laughs> but you know, I was also just kind of struck by something I don't attribute to him. Um, and again, maybe the limitations of, you know, but he's really has really strong comedic timing and he's really yeah. great. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, 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 you know, kind of like the trilogy of the 70s we talk about in a lot of his other films. I'm like, oh, wait, OK, Mr. Portier, you know, you're kind of funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what you see, what you get to, I mean, I think that's, you know, I keep, I, if it's not like a broken record, so I keep talking about Uptown Saturday Night, but I think yeah. you get to see it there, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's no room for it to be highlighted. I mean, you, I think, I mean, he's really funny to me in Lilies of the Field. Um, like, there's not a whole lot of comedy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you see it. Um, but you, but about like I think about the spaces that allow that to flourish, right? Um, uh, which are which are really important. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was hoping too we could kind of dive in uh, a little bit. We talked about Denzel, but I would also love to talk a little bit about um, Sidney Poitier's legacy, um, especially now that he's no longer with us, and you know, kind of what we can learn and who who is, like he laid the foundation for and maybe how that's also limiting and looking at it in that sense. But I think I've always heard of um, him and Denzel as, you know, constantly being in conversation with each other. You know, of course, when he won the Academy Award, he was like, I'm, I'm chasing you and held up the award to him. Yeah, yeah. Um, but even just seeing like a film like To Serve With Love and being like, okay, this is kind of giving me like, you know, lean on me vibes or, <laughs> <laughs> or even like that, the movie Denzel was in the Hard Lessons movie where he's like, mm -hmm. you know, in like LA trying to reform the school and, mm -hmm. you know, um, kind of drawing those parallels. Um, we could talk about that. It's, I mean, it's interesting because I, I haven't, um, I mean, this is also the, in some ways this is also like the, the, the ongoing power of like the classic Hollywood era that we should probably like really like work on deconstructing because we're always like, we're always saying like, who's the contemporary Sidney Poitier? Who's the contemporary like Cary Grant? Who's the, you know, who's the contemporary Elizabeth Taylor, right? Um, what I do think is interesting is thinking about a type of black masculinity that Sidney Poitier kind of like codified on screen and therefore who invokes that and maybe not consistently, but in, in particular roles. And I think, um, I mean, I think Denzel Washington like does that. I, mean, I think Danny Glover to a certain, I mean, there's like, there's other actors who are able, Mahershala, Mahershala Ali, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, um, but without, but without the same, I mean, I think Sidney Poitier though is so unique because of the respectability thing that happens in the 60s. I mean, that's just so, that's just so unique. I mean, I'm thinking about, um, there's been a lot of discussion recently about like um, uh, the, the new like criterion release of Mississippi Masala and like, you know, um, and like you couldn't have that movie and Denzel not have sex with the woman. Like that's, that would be ridiculous, right? But like, but that's what I mean by Sidney Poitier is so, what he did was so unique, partly because of these really like specific constraints of the time in which he was he was making films. Yeah, you've you've said all the names that came to mind. So uh, uh, I I think you know in terms of speaking to the legacy uh, or speaking to the lingering questions and lessons that we can learn from his leg his his vast career. Um, is perhaps it is to take uh, take a pause sometimes and appreciate the value of a little bit of ambivalence, uh, and as a way of kind of keeping our expectations in check, mm -hmm. and actually allowing the work to do what it wants to do and flourish and challenge us. Um, you know, I learn I learn a lot usually from things I, I that that if, that upset me more so than placate me. You know, and 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 I think that, um, yeah, we can learn to be challenged more by uh, possibilities of the art of black film and the art of blackness in general. Okay, um, I guess I'm gonna kick it to the audience. If anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. I will call on you. So when I was rewatching um, the film, one of the things that struck me, you said the optimism, which I, which I absolutely agree with. I think it's also like the way that that optimism is inflected that, that resonates with a particular uh, sort of set of like American ideologies too, right? It's that, it's this idea that you can win over everybody if you're just good enough, right? If you try hard enough, if you are smart enough, if you are individually committed enough, 
you can make it work, right? And I think, um, like we know that's not how that works, but, um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a seductive fantasy, right? I mean, it's, it, 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 we want to believe. Um, I mean, I was also having all these feelings, but this is like such a teacher's movie too. I mean, it's like, we all wanna have that experience, right? I wanna believe that like my students are gonna give me flowers, they never have, but like, I wanna believe that. You've that's never a, gotten a gift? I, well, I have gotten a gift. I, okay. I haven't gotten flowers, <laughs> but, um, but, but you, want, you wanna believe in that, right? And I think there's something incredibly seductive about that idea that you can walk into this incredibly hostile situation and like nothing else changes. I mean, that's, that's the thing is that there's no structural change that happens in the film. It's all just his power of like personality and willpower. And I think that that dovetails real, I mean, I, I know this is set in London, but like it just dovetails so perfectly with like American like bootstraps ideology um, and it feels really 60s in, in that way as, as well, which I mean, I could, there's a whole bunch of stuff I could say to criticize that, but, but I think that's kind of the dream, right? Is that we wanna believe that we have it in ourselves to just overcome whatever sort of obstacles are in front of us, especially as black people. The other thing that strikes me about the, the, the film sort of along the lines of your comment is like, there, you know, I was when I was watching it, and I was thinking, okay, so it's 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 filmed in like they make a point to say it was filmed on site, you know, like in East London, right? Um, but also the ways that I'm thinking about what that would mean when this film shows in New Jersey or in Chicago, where I'm from, or wherever or wherever it is, right? Where you can kind of map whatever identity you want onto those students, right? You can sort of, do you know what I mean? Like there's something about it that's foreign enough that feels safe. Um, whereas we were joking before he came in about like Lean On Me, the Morgan Freeman film, and like why I despise that film, even though like it's kind of like the same premise. Um, it's like those are real kids in, in real life that he, and he, like he messed a lot of them up, but that's, that's another panel discussion. Um, but here, there's, we can sort of map identities onto that, right? So we can sort of imagine Portier like saving any number of troubled youth in any number of settings. And I think there's, there's something about that um, that makes the film, it, it just, it works really well in that regard. Yeah, and it's, and like it's sweet. It's just, a th I, like Lulu, like the song, I can't even get through. I've seen this movie, I don't know how many times. That I mean, song wrecks yeah. me. I can't, like I just, I'm And smiling. we get this song yeah. like what, 20 times yeah. in the film? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And each time it still hits. But Lulu yeah. sings the hell out of that song. Like yeah, give it, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, and like narratively, the, the beats, like that it's, um what's his name, Denim? Like you, you know he's gonna win over, I mean he has to knock Denim out to do it, but like you know he's gonna get Denim at the end. It just, it hits all of those beats that I also think are, it's, it's the optimism, but also I'm thinking just kind of about like classic Hollywood narrative stuff, right? Um, that we, we get the payoffs that we've been, you know, we've been hungering for. Um, even the like the turning down of the good engineering job, you know, um, we get all of that stuff, yeah. I mean, we were also talking about um, things like stand and deliver and dangerous minds as well uh, of these, um, substitute teaching as um, anthropological experience kind of shtick. Um, but there is something to be said about, you know, the way that these kind of films, there's, there's, there's a distinct kind of absence of, a, of, of, a, of structural uh, issues within this around class, that we're specifically dealing with white working class kids. Um, and I had to look it up because, um, you know, the Secretary of Education in England at this time is Margaret Thatcher. And if you're familiar with Steve McQueen's series Small Acts and have seen this small film, you can see that these kinds of schools are going to be on the rise in terms of, uh, of not only uh, targeting uh, working class kids, but also uh, children of color throughout England that it affects the education system for over a decade. Mm -hmm. So this optimism it's quite striking in light of what historically is happening at that time. I mean, I also think of it like as a as a film that's dealing with some like real social anxieties in the in the in the late sixties too, right? I'm thinking about kind of like generational differences between parents and their kids, right? In this film sort of offering I mean I you know, and we get that, right? We get like um, you know, Pamela's mother who's like, Can you talk to like, can you talk to her? Because I you know, because I can't, right? I mean, and that's feels really representative of sort of this again, this like desire for like somebody and here at Sydney Portier to sort of bridge this this gap um, between between generations, if you're thinking about the late 60s and like the the availability of like the birth control pill and just I mean like a lot of things that are that are happening that are kind of creating cultural um, generational divides. Yeah. 
And the, this great fantasy moment when people cared about teachers. <laughs> Part of what contributes to the, the kind of burden of representation that Sidney Poitier experienced was uh, the sense, as I, I was joking about before, this kind of Highlander idea that there can only be one, right? And, and which contributed to a kind of exceptionalism that um, he benefited and struggled with, uh, and particularly around the reception. But, um, you know, it's, it's a part of, particularly in this role, uh, this really strange uh, reverse ethnography uh, moment of him uh, that, that suddenly East London is the foreign land, right? Uh, and, and he is the dignified gentleman that's going to make these girls look pretty, you know? I was, I was just laughing because you said that and I was like thinking about that really awkward scene where he it's asked, the, yeah, where he very asked, the where he says to the teacher, well. like, could you teach them how to do their makeup? Some of the girls could be quite pretty if yeah. they, and I was like, oh, that's cringy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's yeah, I mean, it's it's also like it's a strategy of containment, right? I mean, yeah. there can't be two black teachers in that school. Um, so, um, but I mean, also the, the the whole idea of you can there can only be one. I mean, but that's also if we're talking about Hollywood because there's other stuff happening right. in other sites of independent film production that are that are not that right. Um, which I think it's important to kind of I mean, you know, it's this is. This is 67 and 68, Melvin Matt Peoples is gonna do Story of a Three Day Pass, right? Which comes out the same year, the guest who's coming to dinner and they're both kind of takes on interracial relationships, but like very differently in, in collected, I, I would argue, so. And we have nothing but a man. That yeah. Significantly <coughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's Glenn Ford, isn't it? And yeah, Glenn Ford in the lead in Blackboard Jungle and Sidney Poitier is one of those ruffians who eventually has a change of heart and, and helps and protects him from being stabbed. Um, yeah, there's, there's kind of an air of thinking about uh, the residuals of the teen film. Uh, you know, in terms of thinking about what Raquel was had mentioned before of Hollywood on the eve of, of complete collapse. If you look at the decade earlier, you know, there's a lot of, um, there are moments such as understanding uh, that, that teenagers are consumers. And so that's where you get something like Blackboard Jungle and it's kind of rock and roll inflection. Um, but there, there's definitely a trace of that, I think. And, and thanks for reminding me of that because Blackboard Jungle is kind of an important film of, of thinking about these cycles of, of these wild and crazy teens, except with, to Sir with Love actually um, dials down the hysteria a little bit and tries to actually introduce a bit more empathy in, in, that, in that kind of genre of films. I, I can I can prattle a little bit about I believe it's a, a warm December, which is a, a film he directs later where he he is uh, traveling to Lo if I remember it correctly he's traveling to London for a motocross tournament with his daughter and he ends up falling in love with this black woman who the film is quite interestingly it's about the fact that he eventually discovers that she has sickle cell anemia. And it's, uh, it's, it's an incredible kind of, it's a very wonderful romance. Uh, and again, this, is, this was a film that was directed by Poitier himself uh, and actually gives him an opportunity to, to, to actually work with a, um, um, another black woman on the screen with him and actually be the kind of romantic figure that, he, that wasn't necessarily available to him in the 60s. Who does he, what studio is that? Do you know? I cannot recall, oh, no, but just, but yeah, a warm curious. December is. It's either it may very well have been the second film he directed. Okay. Is it with? I know he started like with a couple of other actors, like first artists, who did the Uptown Saturday Night trilogy yeah. and stuff. And I mean, Her the, I'm sure that's something that Harry Belafonte encouraged him to do because Harry Belafonte had his own independent production company that mm -hmm. did like Odds Against Tomorrow and some other great films. Uh, previous to uh, Sydney's work. 
I mean, I do think, though, sort of riffing on your question a little bit, that it's interesting to think about why the type of star that he was for a certain period precluded uh, the possibility of a of a of a black like love interest, right? Because that's not. I mean, I think about this all the time with um with guests who's coming to dinner, where like they have to establish he's been married before, because if not, it's just weird that he's so eligible, as they tell us over and over and over again. But he's never like had it, you know. But he's been married before, and he had a kid, but they both died, right? And it's like this thing of like, we gotta get them out of the way because we can't, like, that can't be part of the story of guess who's coming to dinner with like Joey being a stepmother to like, you know, um, you know, like uh, John Jr., right? And dealing with his ex-wife, like that's not, you know, we can't even have, like, literally they just, they killed them off, you know? Um, so I, I think it's interesting to think about sort of the, the things that make his, his celebrity work, work, um, what that also precludes, right? And also then how that is inflected differently if you're talking about a black star like Dorothy Dandridge, who, for whom, you know, like Sidney Poitier can play, like there, there are genres for him to be in where he doesn't have to be a romantic lead, you know? But for, black, for like, not even just black, for women, um, you know, actresses at the same time, like what are those exactly, right? Um, and thinking about even how those sort of genre conventions and sort of the sexism inherent in those sort of leave somebody like Dorothy Danbridge sort of just like, well, what is she supposed to do? Who is she supposed to play? Like, she gets to be a teacher in, in Wichimichigit, but, um, but in general, like, they don't know who to pair her with, so. I, I know uh, when he passed, actually, it was very interesting because I feel like those are like, the gifs and images I was seeing a lot is him with Diane Carroll. There is like a very, well, we know why, mm -hmm. but there is a very natural chemistry between them. Mm -hmm. And that's also, I think, another instance where he's with a black woman. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's a little explicit, a little but more it, explicit. But it's interesting to, I mean, I just think it's interesting because like there's, the, there's this tension that I want to keep kind of highlighting, which is like, if, if you want the Poitier who wins the Academy Award, that's not the Poitier who's in necessarily like the film that would have been seen as too black by Hollywood standards, which means pairing him with a black love interest, which is still a, which is still a thing, like, mm -hmm. sadly enough, right? And so that's, I mean, that's why I keep saying it, like, in terms of the frame, like we're talking about a specific type of like Hollywood framing um, that has its limitations, but also its, its privileges uh, for somebody like him, yeah. Thanks, thanks for bringing up Paris Blues. I mean, I, I adore the film and the kind of dynamic between him and Paul Newman, mm -hmm. which I think of as a perfect foil to some of the wackiness of him and Tony Curtis and the Defiant Ones. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, if you haven't mm -hmm. seen Paris Blues, check that out. Oh, Abby Lincoln is his love interest. Yeah, for the love of Ivy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, well, um, thank you all for joining me, especially you guys. Thank you so much. It was so <laughs> wonderful. You. Yes, thank you. <laughs>